will, if you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me to the book of Joel chapter 2. And if you are, when you get there, if you will stand with me, I want us to read just a couple of verses, and they're very familiar verses. You can probably quote them, but I like us to look at them. So when you get there, if you will stand, I will, we will read, and then I'll have you to pray for me, because I need it. I heard somebody say one time, well, I need the prayer, and you need to practice. I guess that's true. We all need the prayer, and we all need the practice. But Joel chapter 2, verse 28, simply states it like this, And it shall come to pass. Afterward, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids, in those days will I pour out my spirit. Would you lift your hands this way and let's pray together. Father, God, we thank you so much tonight for your presence already that's in this place. God, from the very moment that we walked through the door, we sensed your presence. From every song that was sung of praise, we sensed your presence. Through the offering and the giving, we sensed your presence. Now, right now, oh God, we pray that you open up the floodgates of heaven. Rain down on this place tonight, God, the latter day rain of the Holy Ghost anointing. God, that that the old folks talked about, that that the young folks are looking for, that that Moses talked about, that that the prophets of old talked about, God, that that came down on the day of Pentecost. God, one more time, let the mighty river of glory flow into this place that we might receive from you that that we most have the urgent need of. And we will be so careful as to praise you and to give you the glory. Let these lips say, God, only what you would have me to say. Let these ears hear what you would have them to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. And you may be seated together. We're talking about something that is real. We're talking about something that I can remember as a child hearing the old folks talk about the old days. Now, when those days was about, that was a long, long time ago. Because, see, I'm 56 years old. And in my book, that's getting up there. Because I remember thinking 25 was pretty old. I always thought when you reached 25, you'd got there. But here I am, 56, wondering when you're going to get there. Still waiting on the bus to stop. But I'm telling you, when we think about the power of the Holy Ghost, when we start talking about the power and the anointing, we're, we're not talking about something that you can buy. We're not talking about something that you can purchase. We're not talking about something that you can reach over to somebody and say, well, here, I give this to you. It is something that only comes from God on high. Now, yes, you can lay hands on somebody, and you can pray the prayer of faith over them, and if their faith is in tune with God and they are asking God to fill them, all of a sudden you're going to find a change take place in their life. You're going to see a transformation take place. Joel said that in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. You see, it's not just reserved for the church of God. I can remember when they, they, I'd hear them stand up and say, I'm saved, sanctified, and a member of the grand old church of God. I always thought that was something in the Bible. <laughs> you see, it used to be something folks was, was, was proud of to be a part of a movement. Nowadays, they'll say, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? Well, yeah, I kind of do. Do you speak in tongues? Well, on occasion I might. We don't need to be ashamed. We don't need to be afraid. We need to stand flat-footed and boldly say, Yes, I am saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. I do speak in other tongues. I believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I believe in laying on of hands. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe in the fruits of the Spirit. I believe in the manifestation of the Spirit. I believe that God has it for the church today. Why in this world is so many churches dead and dry? Because they, you know, they, 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 there's this little saying that's been going around for a few years, seeker sensitive. 
Well, let's give the people what they want. If I gave Hannah only what she wanted, all she did was eat potato chips, french fries. And that's about the extent of it anymore. But sometimes we got to put something else down in front of them. No, you got to have this. If we just give folks what they wanted, all we give them is pizza parties, fun time, a milkshake and a banana split. What's that going to make them? Fat. We want to give them what God has for them. Now, I, there ain't nothing wrong with the milkshake and a banana split and a pizza party. They, we, we used to do that a lot. We'd, we'd have a youth night and we'd take them out for pizza afterwards. But we gave them God first. We'd take them bowling. We'd take them skating. We'd take them to play laser tag. But I tell you, there ain't nothing any more thrilling than to have that kid that gives you the worst fits run across and you shoot him with a laser gun. And it violated them. <laughs> Preacher, how did you hit that little target? I put a member of a church member's face on it. Now, bam. <laughs> That's just the preacher. I'm sorry. Our, our pastor, he don't ever have those thoughts. In the last days, do you realize how far deep into the last days we are? When did the last days begin? Now, this is just Effler. My opinion, the last days began on the day of Pentecost. Because Peter said, these are not drunk as you suppose. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days, saith God. So if that was the beginning of the last days, we are, we are about 2,000 years deep into the last days. Now they always tell me that in God's time frame, a, a day is a thousand years and years is a day. So we're getting pretty deep into the time of God saying, all right, son, go get your church. So we are deep into the time when the church needs to be more on fire than it ever has been before. Now, anybody ever, ever read the history of the church of God, how the church of God was born? The church of God was born out of men that gathered together because they were tired of man-made creeds and doctrines. They were tired of, of, of mundane, everyday, going through the form and the motion and denying the power of God. And they got together and they began to pray and they began to pray and they began to seek God. And, and then the power of God fell upon them. You know, when I was growing up, you, you, were, you were told more what you couldn't do than what you could do. You, you couldn't chew bubble gum. You, you couldn't drink a Coca-Cola. You couldn't play Rook. You couldn't play softball. You couldn't play baseball. You couldn't play football. You couldn't wear shorts. Girls couldn't cut their hair. Boys had to cut their hair. I mean, there, there was so much. And, and, and we got to study, and, 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 and we, we found that one of the reasons that the church got so stringent that way is that they had got to seeking God so earnestly and so sincerely and so deeply that they would start giving up this, and they'd start giving up that, and they'd start giving up this, and they'd start giving up that. And they would seek God and seek God, and the power of God would come upon them. And they associated not doing this with the power of God coming. They, they didn't dawn on them that the power of God came because they were seeking him. That's it. You see, you, you don't, think, well now, they might be something you might need to give up. Uh, you might need to give up your X-rated videos. You might need to give up your malt liquor. You might need to give up, you know, talk to God about it. But they would seek God and the power of God would fall. I'm saying today that the churches, the church of God, the Baptist church, the Methodist church, the Lutheran church, any church that calls itself a Bible-believing, faith-believing place, if they will get on their knees, what did the Scripture tell us? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now, he ain't talking to the world out there. That's right. 
He said, if my people, which are called by my name, in other words, if those that sit on the church pew day after day, Sunday after Sunday, week after week, if they would seek my face, if they would humble themselves, if they would fall upon their knees, if they would humble and call and seek and pray, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I heal their land. Then will I give them the needs of their life. And, and then they will see the Spirit being poured out upon them. We find a great man named Jesus standing on a hilltop of Mount Olives. And he is standing there and he is about to ascend up into heaven to his father. And he speaks something to the disciples and you and I know that he would never lie. Jesus never fails. But he said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but ye shall receive power. He's re reiterating what Joel had said. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. He goes on to say that you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, wherever you are and wherever you go, you shall be a witness for me after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, I have found when folks first get saved, they are so excited they tell everybody about Jesus. What happens to us? Well, I think, in my opinion, we run into a lot of those church folks. Well, just don't get ex don't don't be too excited. It'll die down. It'll go away. You won't be that excited. What's wrong with us? We used to sing a song. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Then why do we wake up all grumpy and hateful? <laughs> Ain't that the truth? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before if our relationship with him continues to grow. What happens to a lot of church folk is, and I found this true, is, is they'll pray and they'll seek God. They'll, they'll draw close to him. They'll get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Bam, I've got it. Now I can relax. What a lie. What a lie. When we receive power, the Holy Ghost power, the Holy Anointing power, the devil's going to come up and start slapping you in the face and telling you it ain't real. You didn't have nothing. All you did was some jibber-jabber. No, well, let me tell you something, devil. I did get the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and I resist you, and I rebuke you, and I command you to get thee behind me. And when you can't handle him, just turn him over to God. Jesus said you shall receive power. Why is it so important for the church today? To have the Holy Ghost. To have that power. So that they can have power. In your, in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you can turn there with me. Paul said, now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. In just hillbilly language, he said, don't be stupid. Understand about the spiritual gifts of God. When you receive the power of the Holy Ghost, it opens up a whole broad avenue of spiritual gifts that is open and available to you. What in the world are you talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse number 7 but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another the working of miracles. To another prophecy. To another discerning of spirits. To another diverse kinds of tongues. To another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and self same Spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. You see, you and I need to have these gifts in operation in our life on a daily basis. 
Oh, it doesn't mean that you're all the time going to walk around with a spiritual utterance and you're going to prophesy over somebody. Now, I run into those folks. You know, we, we call them crackers sometimes or something, you know, I don't know. Now, you're going to run into some folks that's going to read your mail and it's going to be real as the day is long. You better listen to them. Because they are in tune with God and they know God and God knows them and God uses them in mighty, mighty ways. Heard, uh, I believe it was on the uh, 24 to double tape. The guy was talking about the five-fold ministry, the pastors, preachers, teachers, prophets, and uh, evangelists. And, and, and it says... Of those, everybody kind of brags about being the three, but when it comes to being a prophet, and, uh, and what was the other one? Apostle. Being a prophet and apostle, they just kind of back up and shy away from that. But you see, you and I, we are having these available to us to do the work of Jesus Christ in this world to reach lost souls. These gifts of the Spirit is what needs to be manifest in the church today. That's why it's so important that, yes, the Holy Ghost is for the church today. Like I said earlier, there's a lot of churches that are scared to death for the power of God to move. I have been in them when, when it, I mean, it, it was just dry as cracker juice. And for some reason, all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit would start to move. And you could tell people just start getting uneasy. Not, know, not knowing what to do, not knowing what to do. And that's a shame because some of them were church of gods. I'm talking about Pentecostal, supposedly, churches. But we have gotten so to the point to where we are so concerned with, well, if we can just get them in. Yes, let's get them in. Let's fill them up. Let's get them in. Let's give them what the Holy Ghost has. Let's not be afraid of our heritage. Let's not be afraid of what the Bible says. It also talks about over in the book of Galatians, the fruit of of the Spirit. We need to have the Holy Spirit in the church today so we can have the spiritual gifts, but also have the spiritual fruit. What is the spiritual fruit? The spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit is Galatians chapter 5 verse number 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. I think one translation calls it self-control. That's hard to find in places today, self-control. People get something in their head and they think, well, I've got to do that. I've just got to do that. I can't resist that. Oh, my daddy done it. My mama done it. My grandpa done it. My great grandpa done it. I just got to do it. No. What does the scripture say? But you shall be changed. You shall be transformed. You shall be renewed. You don't have to be what you once was. You don't have to be what mama was. You don't have to be what daddy, grandpa, great grandpa, what the past was. You don't have to be none of that. Why? Because when Jesus comes in, the power of the Holy Spirit transforms you. That's why we need him today. We got so many people out there. We got so many young people out there, so many older folks out there who don't know nothing about anything. I start talking about God at work and they're like, huh? They, they, they'll, they'll talk at work about going to church, about like going to a restaurant. You know, they, they, they go duty service. Well, it's Sunday. I wonder how many of us come because it's Sunday. Or how many of us came because we said, God, I want an encounter with you. You see, I don't ever want to come to church just because pastor expects me to be here. I don't ever want to come to church just because the day on the calendar says it's the day that we put on a, a, a good suit of clothes and go to church and sit on a pew and listen to the people sing, listen to the preacher preach, and then get up and go home. You might as well sit on the couch with your feet propped up and watch TV. What we need to do is come into the house of God and say, Father, I come because I need an encounter with you.
Father, I need an experience with you. Father, I want to receive from you. God, I, I, I'm not looking from, from your hand. I, I'm not looking for the gold dust to fall from heaven. I'm not looking for my teeth to automatically be filled with gold fillings. I, I'm not looking for God, my bank account to be miraculously filled with money. God, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to come upon my life to transform me from the miserable, wretched soul that I am into that which you have made me to be. You know, I was, I was talking with some folks here recently, and, and I began to realize folks out there experience problems. Folks out there experience battles with the devil. I don't know about you, but it seems like I fight him every day. And I know I'm not the only one. You fight the enemy every day. Why? Because you are a child of the Most High God. The Scripture says that, that, that when we put him out, he goes and gets some buddies and comes back. Why? Because he knows that the power that put him out is stronger than him, so he's going to have some help. But what he needs to find out is when he gets back, there's something there greater than anything he'll ever bring back. And that being the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It is that same power that raised Jesus from the dead that comes inside of you. I'm not talking about electricity. I'm not talking about static. I'm talking about a power that, that, that no atomic generator can generate. I'm talking about something that only God himself has to send down to his body, to his believers, to his people, whosoever would call upon his name and say, Lord, I have need of you. Let's not be saved, sanctified, and satisfied. Let's be saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. I know this is old-timey stuff. I know this is old-fashioned preaching, but hey, I'm old-fashioned. I'm old-timey. I can sit up here and smile at you and tell you God loves you. And if you'll feel good about yourself, you'll wake up in the morning and everything will be happy. But you'll wake up in the morning and the devil will be in your head and you'll say, what's wrong with that smiling preacher? I want somebody to tell me that God can change my life. And I want somebody to tell me how God can change my life. And it's by the blood of Jesus. It's by going to the cross and saying, Father, forgive me of my sin. Father, be that that I need and come down and wash me and cleanse me and make me whole. You see, Pastor talks about this morning that, that going back to the original Lord's Supper. When God instituted the Passover, when the children of Israel were held bondage in Egypt, and they all went out and they got their lamb and they put the lamb out and they sacrificed the lamb and they took the blood and they put the blood on the doorposts and on the lintel and when the death angel came the death angel looked and the death angel saw the blood the Bible said that the death angel passed over that house but the house that didn't have the blood all the firstborn was taken I began to realize one day after some study that it wasn't just the firstborn son. It was the firstborn of everything that was there. The firstborn goat, the firstborn lamb, the firstborn cow, the firstborn oxen. It was all taken. Can you imagine the devastation? Whenever you and I begin to realize that there has been blood applied, there's been blood applied to the altar of life, that God says, I see that blood. I don't see your sin no more. We got to say, Lord, baptize me through that blood. Lord, save my soul. Cleanse me. Make me whole and transform me. Change me from what I was into what you want me to be. Be ye converted. That your sins may be blotted out. You see, back in the day, Moses and the priests would go into the, into the temple and they would put the blood and the sacrifice and they would sprinkle it on the holy of holies and, and they would dance around and praise God and God would look down and, and he would see the blood, but all he would see was the sins covered by the blood. But on that day when Jesus was hanging on that cross, 
When he gave his life, when he said it is finished, and he bowed his head and he gave up the ghost, and the earth would shake and it would tremble and it would quake, and the veil in that temple was rent in two from top to bottom, was that nobody but the holy of holy priests could go in. Now every born person on the face of the planet can go into the holy of holies. Where is the holy of holies? The holy of holies is where the presence of God is. It may be right here in this altar. It may be beside your couch in your living room. It may be beside your bed in your bedroom. You might even get down beside your commode in your bathroom, but you can call that the Holy of Holies because you can go into the presence of God, call upon the name of the Lord, and he shall come to your rescue. We don't have to wait for some slick, shiny-haired preacher to come by. All we got to do is call upon the name of the Lord. Lord Jesus, I need you. Lord Jesus, I need you. Lord, help me. I'll never forget one time I called upon the Lord. I was driving a, a truck for air freight. I was going down Kingston Pike. I was going through Farragut, and there's a red light there. I showed it my wife the place here a few weeks ago. There's a red light there, and it, 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 it was green on my part. But there was a woman coming down through there, and she came out through that red light, and I was a barreling down, inter, uh, barreling down Kingston Pike, and I had that big truck, and it was loaded down, and I just grabbed the steering wheel, and I said, Lord Jesus, help me, and I pushed on that brake. I looked in my rearview mirrors. I could see smoke boiling off of my tires. That truck, I was holding on, and I was pulling. I wasn't turning. That truck slid over this way. That woman stopped dead where she was. I went past her and that truck comes back over all on its own. Well, God moved that truck around, saved that. Had I hit her, I'd have hit her broadside, killed that woman, but I called on God. God helped in that moment, in that instant. A lot of folks say, preacher, you're just making that up. I am not. God is real, and we all we got to do is call upon him. You may be down and out. You may be facing the day. You don't know what you're going to do. Last week, I, me and my wife was in a spot. We didn't know it was coming down to the place to where we was going to have to have a decision on the place where we live. And we thought if we didn't have financing lined up by the 31st, we was just going to be out of luck. We had been praying. Some of you folks have been praying. I called the lady, and uh, she said, what's it, what's, what's it up? And I told her, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. I've been turned down three times because I haven't been where I work for three, six months. She says, I was afraid of that. She says, you got six more months. Right. She says, you don't have to do anything for six months. She says, you let me know in six months. Can I tell you, God will answer. You, you'll be quaking, quaking in your boots. You know, why didn't I call her four days ago? <laughs> My wife said, hmm? You see, a lot of times we use God as the last resort. Let's go to him in the first place. Let's go and call upon him because he can give us the gifts of the Spirit. Do you know the difference in gifts of the Spirit and fruits of the Spirit? I used to wonder that. And I came up with a very simple little explanation. The fruit of the Spirit has to be cultivated. It grows. The gifts of the Spirit, they just give to you. God just says, here, this is it. Have you noticed that? Look at that, the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. You know them folks, you got to work on loving. You know, you know joy. Sometimes you got to work at being joyful. I love you. You got to work sometimes at having peace. You know, instead of, I want to kill you, let's have peace. Long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. I've asked God before, okay, God, if faith is a fruit, why does it say it comes by hearing? He says, I want you to hear my Word. I want you to read my Word. You read my Word, you hear my Word, your faith will grow. You use your faith, it will grow. You see, I found a lot of folks, a lot of times, they say, Preacher, I just wish I had the faith you had. I said, if you'd pastor people like you, you would. Oh, uh, y'all didn't get that. Meekness, temperance, 
against such. There is no law. God gives us the fruit of the Spirit, but you've got to cultivate them. You've got to work on them. How can you do that by having the gifts of the Spirit? You see, you have the gifts of the Spirit. They work in hand in hand with the fruit of the Spirit. And how does all that work together? By the gift of the Holy Ghost working within our lives. I've had people just say, Preacher, if I can just barely make it in, I'll be happy. Why? Do you like to go to a buffet and just get a saucer? No, you like to get the big hubcaps. <laughs> and fill it up. Now, if you want a big plate, you go to Las Vegas. And you go out there, to, it looks, I forget the name of the motel, but it looks like a castle. They got the biggest plates I ever seen in my life for you to put food on. I, I, I went with a fellow one time and I said, man, I said, I know a lot of folks would love to have these plates. Because I've seen them go, to, you know, Shoney's and they'll have two or three plates. Let's do that with God. Like, God, give me a big plate full. God, I want more of you. We need the power of the Holy Ghost today. When I, when I was a little boy, it, it wasn't nothing to to wake up on the church pew and, and, and see people just dancing all over the place. And as I became a teenager, you know, I, I began to watch those folks and, and begin to realize that, that there was something that was real. And I, I can remember sitting back on the, on the church pew and, and thinking, God, what am I going to do? My knuckles would turn white holding on to that church pew because I knew God was saying, come. But I was 13 years old. God called me to the altar. I'll never forget the place, the spot. I can take you to the very spot where I knelt down. And I prayed and asked God to save me. And he saved me. And the next night, I believe it was, is in a revival. Brother Monty Stevens was preaching. I just went, I just went to the altar. I mean, it wasn't no big to do. He just said, if you want the Holy Ghost, come down and pray. I went to the altar and, and then began to pray. Of course, you know, there, there was folks all around me. They had this and over here, and they, they were screaming in their ears, just hold on, just hold on. And one of the said, turn loose, brother, just turn loose. And one over here saying, say glory, say glory. And over here saying, say hallelujah. Had them so confused. I used to teach teenagers. And I'd say, all you do is just say, God, I want the Holy Ghost. I said, then when he tells you what to say, say it. It's that simple. We make things so hard. We see folks on TV and think, oh, that's how it is. Or, ooh, it's got to be that way. All we got to do is that old song that says, just as I am, I come unto thee. Tonight, I don't know about you. But I want more of the Holy Ghost in my life. Like I said, when I was 13 years old, I got saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. And that was in February. And in April, God called me to preach. I was at a, at a revival over in John Sevier, Church of God. Brother Walter is, well, he's done going to be with the Lord was holding hold revival. That night he preached on the prodigal son. There I was, 13 years old. I was saved, sanctified, full of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden my heart began to pound out of my chest. He was given the altar call, come to the altar. I was like, God, if I go to that altar, everybody in this building is going to think I'm a prodigal son. But then I remembered a word that my old pastor, Brother Gordon Stallings, told me. Because I'd talked to him about things such as that. He said, Jimmy, he said, any time you feel like going to the altar, he said, it don't matter what the altar call is about, you get up and go to that altar. Yes, he says, because it may very well be. He said, there may be somebody on the other side of the building praying saying, God, if somebody else will go, I'll go. He says, then God will start looking for an obedient vessel. He said, if you go, then they've got to deal with God. He said, you may be the, so from that day then, you know, if God said to go, it didn't matter what the invitation was, I'd go. So that night, my heart was beating out of my chest. I said, all right, God, I, don't, I prodigal son or not, here I come. I went to that altar and I started praying. I said, God, I do not know why I'm here, but I'm here because you said to come. And then God, in his 
love, mercy, and grace said, I want you to preach my word. Then you talk about getting scared. Because like I said, 13 years old, I was shyer then than I am now. I talked less then than I do now. Now, I know you folks don't believe that because I get to preaching, it just don't stop. But on a normal circumstance, I don't talk. When you talk to my wife, she says, why don't you talk to me? I just, you know, I'm just that type of person. But God said, I want you to preach my word. I told, I told my mom and told my pastor and different ones and had these ladies, they, they had a little mission up in Wall and they said, we want you to preach your first sermon for us. So I went up there and man, now this sounds impressive. The place was packed. You couldn't get nobody else in there. Of course, the building was only about a 12 by 15. But it was packed. And when I gave the altar call, you couldn't get in the altar because everybody was done there. But from that day to this, any time God said, I want you to preach, here I am, Lord, send me. Have I been good all that time? No. There was times whenever I was growing up, I thought, I, I, I've, I'm wasting my life. I'm missing out on all the fun. I'm missing out on this. But you know what? I wasn't missing out on nothing. Because I had God. I had the power of the Holy Ghost. I'd rather have Him as anything. I'd rather have him in my life as to have my bank accounts full. Can I tell you tonight that the Holy Ghost is for today? Yes. Tonight, if you don't know him, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty now. You see, I've done preached that you need him. Now the question is, do you have him? And if the answer comes up, no, I don't have him, then the next question is, why not? It's like that old saying, if we laid $100 bills up here on this altar, and we said, whoever comes up here can have one, every last one of you come up here and get a $100 bill. But for some reason, when we say, Jesus has the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost, if you want to receive him into your life, People just kind of sit back and say, well, I don't know. Why? Is it fear? Is it, I, I, I've, I've talked with folks before that said, well, preacher, I'll have to change. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, you'll have to change. You may have to give up something. And then you may not. You know? You, you might not have to give up Diet Coke. You know, you might not have to give up mashed potatoes and gravy. I'm just saying, if the Lord has something to deal in with you and says, give this up and I will fill you, hey, that's a no-brainer. That's a no-brainer. I had one, one, one time in, in my church, I, I did some crazy things, Pastor. Uh, you, you, may, you may say, this dude's crazier than I ever thought he was. I, I did some crazy things. I had, I went out to Walmart and I got the biggest trash cans I could find. I got two of them. Put one on each side of the altar. Told folks I wanted them from then, you know, that day forward. I wanted to bring their junk. I wanted to bring their trash. I wanted to bring their garbage that was polluting their life. And I said, now don't bring your potato peelings and empty cans and all that. I said, but if there's stuff that's in your life that's garbage, come and throw it away. We had folks throw cartons of cigarettes away. We had beer cans in there. We had X-rated movies. We had R-rated movies. It, I mean, there, there was all kinds of junk that went in them garbage cans. Do you realize that there may be something that, that's, that now, now I may be meddling right here, but I feel the Holy Spirit going this way. There, there may be something that you hold as a precious memento in your home. It might be that that big, tall, I don't know what to call them, but the glass that they fill it full of whiskey or something that you drink, and they got them as souvenir stuff, and a lot of folks have those. And, and oh, that, that's, a, that's a memento of, of when me and Billy Bob went to the beach, and oh, just a marvelous time that we had. Do you realize that's an attachment of the past that will bring you down? Yeah, I'm crazy. I believe that. There's stuff in our homes that, you know, we, we wouldn't allow somebody to come in and sit on our couch and cuss like a sailor, but we'll watch them on TV do it. We don't want nobody coming in our house smoking pot, but we'll watch them do it on TV. 
You hearing me? Now, you know, I, I'm not perfect. There's times my wife has to get the TV and turn it off. They, I tell you, they, there's junk out there. It's unbelievable. I'm just to the point of saying, you know what? Forget TV. Because we, we, we got this one. We thought it was fabulous. It was free. And you can get it on, on your TV and, and you don't have to pay nothing. It's free. 99% of the junk on there you can't watch. I mean, it, I'm talking yuck. As Joyce Meyer say, double yuck. But yet we will allow ourselves to be pulled in. So do we need the Holy Spirit today? Yes. Why? So that we can be set apart. He says to be ye a separate generation. Come out from among the wicked. Be ye separate for you are chosen. You are holy. You are a royal priesthood. Do we need the Holy Ghost in our lives today? Absolutely. Do we have him today? Absolutely. What do we do to get more of him? I'm glad you asked. We ask him. Lord, fill me. Lord, change me. Lord, transform me. Now, don't be surprised when you ask God to change you, he starts changing you. You know, one, one of the things that has astounded me over the years is when we pray the prayer of faith and ask God to do something, we're shocked when he does it. Why are we shocked? We should be expecting with anticipation, expectancy.